All right, in this section, we're gonna look at applying integration to a physics concept. Specifically, we're gonna talk about work. Generally speaking, the concept of work is simply the amount of energy it takes to complete a certain project. So let's spend a second talking about force and work and making sure we understand the differences between metric and US customary units. And before I go much further, I wanna make it very clear that physics is not my specialty. This is about the limit of what I know of these topics right here, but this is what all you'll need to know too to be able to implement integration in solving work problems. First and foremost, we're gonna rely on Newton's second law of motion to help us with the concept of force. As he defined it, force is mass times acceleration. Simply put here, the idea of force is how much strength it takes or how much energy it takes to move something, but that is dependent on the size or the density of that object. And one way to conceptualize force then is the idea of pushing an object, right? If we had something very small and we're trying to push it, it would be very easy to accelerate or change the direction of that object. If we had a massive object, it would take more force to move it at exactly the same speed. And to clarify something, so force has nothing to do with the speed at which something is moving. It's the change in speed or the acceleration. So if you have an object in any state, how much can you actually affect it? So then the units. For the metric, force is calculated in newtons. And the base units then for this newton force in terms of metric is kilograms, which is the mass, times the acceleration or meters per second squared. And important to our discussions and our examples is this concept of rate of force. And in this case right here, it's really just calculate the newtons per meter of an object. So if I divide newtons by meters, I'll get newtons per meter, and the units for that, dividing out the meters, would be kilograms per second squared. And here introduces a really important concept that you might not have heard before, but it's really foundational and important, is the fact that kilograms for the metric system and pounds for the US customary system do not measure the same things. Kilograms measure mass. Mass of an object does not change no matter where it is. If it's on the Earth's surface, if it's in the atmosphere, if it's on the moon, the kilograms are exactly the same. And then if you actually wanted to compute weight from kilograms, you'd have to apply the effect of gravity, which would then give you this unit of force. Then in the US customary system, we as this base unit for force use pounds. And that's really important to state is that for pounds, you, your, your weight does change. In fact, at different place on the Earth's surface, you'll weigh slightly different. Your weight here and your weight in Australia is not the same, but your kilograms would be the same. Also, if you go to the moon, your, as I said, your kilograms will be the same, but your weight will be very different because of the effect of gravity. And what I really wanna emphasize here is the idea of pounds takes into consideration the effect of gravity, but kilograms don't. And in the future examples, you'll see us taking that into account for things that are affected by gravity. Then also to say here, this idea of rate of force, so this is pounds, we'll be using in our examples, pounds per foot. Okay then, that's just a quick introduction of the difference between the metric and US customary, and dealing with this idea of force, We'll be dealing with pounds and newtons, but when we do our work, you'll see that we'll often do newtons per meter or pounds per foot to be able to attack a complicated question. And then importantly, the other main player here is work. And work is, it basically computes, um, it, it gives you a value for the amount of, of, of energy to complete a job. Specifically, work is the force times distance. So then mathematically, saying that work is force times distance is saying to figure out work is this value which computes the amount of energy, let's say, to, to complete a task or a job, is it takes two things. You multiply how much it takes you to push this object, if we're pushing something from, from left to right right here, how much it takes you to push that 
times how far you decide to push it, right? So if you can think about just as a physical activity, if you're moving something heavy, so it's gonna take a lot of force just to move that a little bit, the overall work then is computed by, I need a, I'm gonna push that 20 feet. The value of that is considered work. So then following the above explanations of force, computing work or finding the units of work is very easy because we're just going to be multiplying our force units by distances. And there's no reason not to use meters for metric and feet for US customary since our, our rates of force and our force is measured in that. But in this case, so work for the metric system would be the newtons, which is the force, times your distance, which is meters. So this right here, the units you could call are newton meters. But more commonly, you'll hear these called joules. And then for the US customary units, we have a force measure of pounds. And then our distance we're computing in terms of feet. And then uh, pretty straightforward is with our naming here. We call these foot pounds. So again, to summarize this, first of all, Newtons is the basic of the base of force measurement in the metric system. Pounds is the force measurement for US customary units. And then for the concept of work, we compute Newton meters or more commonly joules for the metric system. And then we have foot pounds for the US customary system. All right, now, depending on your background and your experience with physics, that was either, either the easiest thing you've heard of in a long time or the most complicated. But just to quickly review this concept is that force is this measure of mass times acceleration. When you have the metric system, you'll often be given information simply in kilograms and you'll have to, you have to apply the idea of acceleration. The examples that you'll see soon from us uh, are, for instance, if you're picking something up, you have to add the effect of gravity on that object to compute its force. Pounds already takes that into account. And then when you get, you complete the work, uh, you complete the job of finding work uh, for metric system that will be joules or Newton meters and then US customary units that will be foot pounds. So what we're going to do then is we're going to consider situations that have variable force. This is really important and really commonplace in real life situations. Like for instance, I'll say this, if I picked up a brick, grabbed it, had the force that it requires me to hold that brick and walk 10 feet and put it down, throughout that work, at least if you consider the time when I'm holding it and going that 10 feet, the force is exactly the same. That The effort it takes me to hold that brick doesn't change. Now, you could say, if I'm weak and haven't been working out, I, I might, it might feel like it's more work as I move along, but, but the weight of the brick does not change. We're going to consider situations where the force to act on an object does change. And that's really realistic. Like one example I was thinking about, just thinking kind of like, what are examples of this in the world? There are a lot, but one that came to mind right away was me knowing when I had friends growing up that did newspaper routes, right? So think of uh, a newspaper boy or girl who on, the, on their bike or in their backpack has a hundred newspapers, right? When they take off out of their driveway to deliver the newspapers, like just think about that weight on this little kid. It's like 5 a.m. and they're gone. It's probably raining. And they had to beg all those newspapers, which I'm not sure if any of you have done this, but that's a lot of work in itself. But anyways, they're, they're headed out, right? And at first, let's say they got like 40 pounds on their back as, as they're going to the neighborhood. But by the time they're halfway through their route, right? Now the pack is only 20 pounds. In fact, every time they deliver a newspaper, the weight changes, thus the force changes. While that's a fairly silly example, I hope that you can see how that's actually a realistic thing that happens really often. Now let's attack how you use integration to uh, calculate work. All right, so then to build the idea of how we can use integration to help us attack these work problems, we first are going to do the work to find this f of x, which we call a force function. And what this does is for any point, for any x value along an interval, and we might need to superimpose this information and you'll see examples of that. So for any value on a given interval, um, if we choose an x value on that interval, this function outputs the amount of force. Again, that's Newton's for the metric system or the US customary units, 
One hint, by the way, one way that we're gonna do this is we're first gonna find this rate of force and then apply it to the situation. So if we have this force function, again, just to give some context to this, if you go back to that newspaper example I was talking about a second ago, is that, um, like, let's say X is how many houses that this kid has already visited. You could plug in 10, and then this out, it would output the amount of weight or the force on this kid as they bike to, to the next house. So if we have a function that does that over a certain interval, then what we can do, we break this interval into n sub intervals like we always do in kind of our building of this. We can find or approximate the work it takes on any of those given sub intervals by applying this, this force function to us any sample points on that interval and then multiplying it by the length of that interval. And this is really important, again, for like that example of this newspaper. This would be, hey, if you plugged in after 10 homes, this is now how much force is required by the, how much force is required by this kid to bike to the next house. This would be like the distance to the next house, for instance. But in this case right here, we take an interval, we're applying a force through that interval, right? This will give us an approximation for the force over that interval times the length of that interval. So this is the force, this is the distance, and it outputs the work for that interval. And as always, if we choose a few sub intervals, this will give us a pretty bad approximation for the total work over the interval A, B. But as we have more and more and more of these sub intervals, then we can compute the overall work on the job on this interval by taking the definite integral from A to B of the force function times delta dx. And just to summarize that then, so to compute the work over an interval, if we have a force function, what we do is we apply the integral from A to B of that force function. Again, this, this, this differential of x right here comes from that delta x in the original statement. So that's that, that distance part, force times distance. And what this is, generally speaking, it's all of these little works computed along the interval. So all these little snapshots as the work is being done, or as the job is being completed, all these little works. So you're summing those up at each of these ith intervals, but you're letting the number of intervals go to infinity. Again, the sum and this limit is the creation of this integral. As always, probably this will make a lot more sense once we start applying these two examples. Again, we have metric and US customary, and we're going to use this basic definition to find work. All right, here we have a classic example of work. In this case, we're being asked to compute the work required to stretch a spring a certain distance. In order to tackle this, we actually need Hooke's Law. What Hooke's Law say, states is that the force required to stretch and maintain a stretch, so it's actually to hold a spring at a certain length, is proportional to the distance you're trying to stretch it. That's really important, but specifically what that means is the force required to stretch a spring at a certain distance changes as you pull it. And you might see now that how this is gonna be an application of the integration technique we were just talking about, is because as you pull this spring, it's actually really easy at, for, at first, but as you pull it, because of Hooke's Law, it gets harder, it takes more force at, at the longer you pull it away. In fact, you don't have to just be stretching this. Hooke's Law works if you're compressing a spring. But in this case right here, so then for, to be proportional to the distance simply means you have some constant k being multiplied by the distance you are away from rest. So that's really important right here. K is the distance from what we call the equilibrium, and I'll talk about that in one second. But I also want to say is this K right here, we call this the spring constant. And the point is with the spring constant is every spring that you make has a constant K value. And because it might come up in the applications, I want to make it clear right here. So x equaling zero means the spring is at rest. We also call this the equilibrium. If your x value is negative, we would be compressing this. So if you compress this spring and push it in, those are x values less than zero. And then stretching it would be x values greater than zero. All right, now we're ready to go. What we're going to do first is use this law right here to find the force function. And we're going to need this information right here and right here. 
So the idea is, so the spring is 20 centimeters, so it's 20 centimeters at rest or at its equilibrium. And we know the force required to get it to a length of three, 30 centimeters. So then to impose this information on this law right here, first of all, this measure right here is 20 centimeters. This is when the spring is in equilibrium or we say it's at rest. We're looking, we're being told in this situation about stretching it all the way to 30 centimeters. Importantly is that an X in this case is the amount of stretch. So X is not 30, X would be 10 centimeters. As said previously, for these work problems and the force problems, when we're dealing with a metric system, we're going to use meters. So I'm gonna translate 10 centimeters into 0 0.1 meters. So then we know the force is 25 newtons when x equals 0 0.01 meters. So we're working with this force function right here. We have 25 newtons equals k, times the number of meters, which is 0 0.1 meters. And importantly here to make it clear, what we're doing is trying to find the spring constant. These first sentences are helping us figure out the spring constant. And then once we have our force function, when we have K, we will then be able to apply integration to this. But in this case right here, what I'm going to do is divide by one-tenth of a meter. When I divide by one-tenth, it's the same thing as multiplying by 10. So what I'll end up is getting 250 newtons per meter, which is our spring constant. Thus, for this spring, we know the force function then is 250x. So we found our force function and we know from the previous conversation that to calculate work then, all we need to do is integrate the force function on our interval. In this case, we're dealing with x. x is this distance away from equilibrium. Specifically, we need the work required to go from 20 centimeters to 25. This is important to know both of these because this right here, 20 centimeters, is when x equals zero, so that's at rest or equilibrium. 25 centimeters, this means the x that equals five. Again, the displacement from rest, um, but I'm not gonna write it as centimeters. As always, I'm going to write this in terms of meters. So there we have it. We got our force function. We have our bounds from zero to 0 0.05 meters. And so to find the work, all we need to do is integrate from zero to 0 0.05. Here's my force function, 250x dx. And this is really straightforward, just the anti-power rule. I get x squared divided by two, so this becomes 125x squared. We're evaluating from zero to 0 0.05. And then plugging in 0 0.05, because the zero does nothing here, I get 5 sixteenths or 0 0.3125. And these are Newton meters or joules. So a quick review. This is often a first example of using integration to, a, to find work because we have this pretty simple force formula. In the future examples, we're not gonna have this formulaic formula or a law that help us. We'll have to create the force formula based on logic and the application that we're looking at. But one thing I really wanna emphasize here, and again, this is more of a physics thing than a math thing, but it helps you a lot in this section, is that Newtons, or there's 25 Newtons in this first situation, is not taking this and stretching it all the way at 30 centimeters. The Newtons is a force to just to hang on to that spring and not let go of it so it goes back to rest. So the Newtons is this measure of just holding it there. The actual measure of going from rest out to 30, or in this case, from rest to 25 centimeters, that is work and in Newton meters, is the, gen the general unit of measurement or joules. That is why, so Newton meters is the reason that we've turned all of these measurements into meters. And anytime you have these metric situations, you're always going to compute them in terms of meters. For no other reason except for that's the standardized unit of measurement of work in the metric system.